Are we good to go? Ready to start? Yeah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad, kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim, na kahmid wa majid. Allahumma baak ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad, kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim, na kahmid wa majid. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlu al aqdatan min nisani of kaw kawli. We begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the exalted, the sublime, the king of kings, and the creator of all things. And we send peace and blessings upon his Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his wives and his family members and his companions and all those who follow their footsteps until the day of judgment asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make us amongst them Allahumma Ameen It's a huge, immense pleasure to be here amongst you guys um, with the topic at hand trying to learn more about our deen come closer to our creator this is a huge blessing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala over us that we're gathering here in the house of Allah doing this, seeking this goal. That in and of itself is a huge blessing. And uh, before I even introduce myself, I always like to begin everything that I do with that reminder. It's a encouraging reminder. It helps uh, keep the goal in mind and encourages us with the reward that we're seeking in doing this. And there's more than one hadith that comes to mind. The first of them, the Prophet ﷺ says, مَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ there is no group of people who gather in any of the houses of the houses of Allah, meaning the Masajid. There's no group of people who gather in any of the houses of the houses of Allah, meaning the Masajid, except that when they gather in the house of Allah and one the Masajid, reciting the book of Allah and studying it amongst each other. Except that Tranquility descends upon them. وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ And mercy envelops them. وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And the angels surround them. So right now, as we're doing this, in this process, in this place, there's angels surrounding us, inshallah. وَذَكْرَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَذَكْرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in His gathering, the gathering of the angels, right? The closest angels to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a heartwarming and heart-shaking idea that Allah mentions our name, right? He says it to the angels out of Pride out of approval that we are in the house, one of the houses of the houses of Allah, trying to get closer to Him and trying to understand His words and His deen. And there's a much longer hadith here also that is very interesting, where Abu Huraira, it's also narrated by Abu Huraira, like the first hadith. He says that the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has angels that go around the pathways, right? They're going around the creation, observing the people as some of the angels are tasked with doing, right? They keep account of the people, what they do, they record it. And when they come across a group of people mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the scholars say this is the general mention of Allah, which includes reading Quran, includes, you know, circles of dhikr, includes seeking knowledge like this, includes any type of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they find such a gathering, they tell each other, come, this is what we're looking for. And the hadith is lengthy, so we won't go over the Arabic just to save time. So he says they surround them and they envelop them in their wings. So they surround them in this fashion until they reach the end of the sama' dunya the, the, the lowest heaven, right? So they're surrounding them all the way up to the end of the lowest heaven. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks them, and he knows better. The Prophet is saying, Allah already knows the answer. But he asks the angels nonetheless, what did you find my servants doing? And they say, we found them mentioning you. They're mentioning Allah, praising Him, thanking Him, making tasbih, saying alhamdulillah, exalting Him, glorifying Him, making takbir. This is the situation that they're in. So then he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asked the angels, did they see me? Have you seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You're here, you're doing this, you're seeking these things without seeing Allah, right? None of us have seen, have seen Him. So they say, no, they haven't. The angels respond, they have not seen you. So he asked them, what if they seen me? So the angels respond naturally. What would, what would you do if you saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You'd do more, right? So they'll, they, they would increase in these actions. So then he asked them, what do they want? What are they asking for? And the angels respond, they're asking for Jannah. They're asking for your mercy. He says, have they seen it? And the angels say, no, they haven't. So he says, what if they did see it? And the angels respond, obviously, they would do more seeking it out. And then he asked them, and what are they seeking protection from? They say, they are seeking protection from the fire. He asks again, have they seen it? And they say, no. What if they have seen it? 
and they respond in the same fashion, they would do even more to seek refuge uh, from it, seek refuge in you from it, seek protection in you from it. So he says, You are my witnesses that I have forgiven them. Everything that we just, that you attested to, and the scholars say, This is the point, right? This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking them. He knows. And the Prophet says in the hadith, He asks them, and He knows the answer. But the point is not seeking information. The point is to make it public his approval. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the angels to say it out loud. He wants it to be said out loud that I approve of what so-and-so is doing. I approve of the situation that they're in, the goal that they're seeking, which is why we're here again. Right? This is why I chose to begin with this. We're in the house of the houses of Allah. We hope that all these descriptions of hadith apply to us, that we're making dhikr, that we're seeking Allah's protection and mercy and his reward, and that we're seeking protection from his punishment. And that w that is being done sincerely for his sake, that if we were to see any of it, if any of this was exposed to us, it would only increase us in faith and action. And that we hope and pray that we're included in this description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Prophet gave it to us, where he says to the angels, you're my witnesses that I've forgiven these people and I've given them what they asked for. And the part of the beauty of it is the last part of the hadith where the angels, they complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not happy with this situation. Why? They said, فِيهِمْ فُلَانْ لَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ إِنَّمَا جَاءَ لِحَاجَةً So-and-so is there, right? Maybe one of those guys in the back. Someone is here who doesn't, who is not here for this reason. He didn't come to seek knowledge. She didn't come to learn anything. All these things that we just went over, the angels are saying, this person's not included. We know that. They're there for some benefit. Maybe they're meeting a friend. Maybe they're making a purchase. Out of convenience, who knows? They're not there for any of these things we went over. That's what the angels are complaining about. They're there for some other reason. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds say, saying, humul julasa la yashqa min, la yashqa bihim jalisuhum. They are, this is their gathering. No attendee is going to leave empty-handed. No attendee is going to leave miserable. This is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So someone maybe is here because they're forced along or dragged along or they have some other reason to be here. But just from the approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the general gathering, its purpose, he decides that no one will leave empty-handed, no one will leave shortchanged out of this gathering, even someone who's just attending. So we hope that, you know, this is the time to rectify our intentions. We hope that these descriptions apply to us that the Prophet had mentioned, that we're here seeking Allah's forgiveness, seeking His mercy, and trying to get closer to Him and learn more about our deen. So with that being said, inshallah, we'll begin with our topic chosen for the next couple of weeks. My name is Muhammad Badawi. Um, inshallah, for the next couple of weeks, or as long as you guys can stand me, whichever comes first, we'll be going over this book together, inshallah. And this book is called al wasiya The Final Advice or the Farewell Advice and it's by a scholar named Ibn Qudam. So a couple of things before we start with the actual content of the book. The book is very short. It's like 60 pages or so if you minus, you know, the appendices and whatever and whatever uh, background information is in there. The content of the book itself is like 50 to 60 pages. So it's quite short. The topic is also quite simple. Nothing, I'm sure, will be new to you. It's all basic reminders and heart softeners. Things of like the reality of the dunya, the shortness of life. The importance of being enthusiastic when it comes to good deeds. Basic topics like this. And the reason why I chose it is because these basic topics, they're the heaviest hitting. They are the most, you know, the highest caliber in terms of our journey in life. Of course, we need fiqh, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the halal, the haram, the do's, the don'ts. We need theology, right? Belief in the angels and the prophets and their stories and their descriptions. We need all that. We need, you know, the Quran and understand the Quran. But in the bottom, the bottom line is, if you're not sincere, none of this matters. All the knowledge that you gain, all the topics that you seek, all the information that you, we acquire, if it's not sincerely for the sake of Allah, it's a waste of time. In fact, it will be a source of punishment for the person. The Prophet ﷺ told us in the hadith, أَوَلْ مَنْ بِهِمْ النَّارِ The first people who will kindle the fire. They're the first fuel that will light it, that will bring it ablaze. And they are three individuals who... In what it appears to be are good people. They're righteous. They're Muslims. Right? A mujahid, someone who gives his life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the battlefield. A scholar who teaches the Quran and recites it and teaches others. And the last person was... Who's the last person? The hadith. The first three people who will be thrown to the hellfire. One of them is a scholar. Second one is a mujahid. The third one is a... Hmm? 
the, the guy who donates, right? He's a charitable, charitable person who um, go, gives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what's apparent. And then when each person is questioned closely, it is made apparent that their intention was not for the sake of Allah. So the warrior, he was doing it for the sake of a legacy, to be called brave, to be called a hero. The scholar was doing it to be called a scholar, to get prestige, to have the mic and the camera and the lights. And then the char charitable person was doing it to be called a philanthropist, to be get that attention, get that prestige as well. So each person will be told, you had what you sought. You got the title, you got the prestige, you got the attention. That's all that you'll, you're getting from this action. That's what you sought. That was your intention. So here on the Day of Judgment, you have nothing. In fact, you have the punishment is what's in store. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So these things are the heaviest hitting. You know, um, paying attention to our intentions, making sure we're sincere, making sure that we're working for the right reasons, making sure that we have the reality in front of us when we're tempted with fame, tempted with wealth, things that happen to everyone. So this is what this book is all about. These topics are of utmost importance in our journey. In addition, it's, it's quite short, right? It's something that we can cover in a few weeks and have do the topic justice where we fu fully covered it, cover to cover. Um, another interesting reason that I chose the book is the reason why it was written. So the reason why it was written is mentioned in the beginning, which we'll get to in a second. Where Ibn Qudama he says that this book was proposed to me by a few friends of mine, companions, who said, write us an advice. And that was something that people did back then, right? They didn't have posts, right? There was nothing, there was no online, there was no method of uh, sharing information the way that we have today. So it was a common practice that people would request from their friends or request from a religious scholar, religious figure, write us a written treatise, you know, something that is compiled together that is just advice and sometimes it asks for something specific write us something about the hereafter or write us something about aqidah or fiqh and then someone would write it and send it over to them and it was like this you know 10 20 30 50 100 pages and sometimes they would share it with their friends they'd hand copy it and then it would become a popular book that's actually the story of a lot of popular books where a scholar wrote it at the request of some companions or colleagues and then it became copied to the point where it becomes a book. This is exactly what happened to this book. And why am I starting you know, with this point? It's because he says in the beginning, in the introduction, One of the righteous brothers asked me to write this set of advices this book called The Advice, he asked me to write an advice. And I didn't want to. I, I told myself I wouldn't do it. I refused to at first because I know that me, myself, I'm in need of advice. You ever experienced that where like you might have some background information about something, but you say, if I tell this person, they say, oh, so-and-so is a sheikh, or like now all of a sudden they think they're, right now they're going to give us a lecture. You're, you've gotten that response, I'm sure. Right, where you, 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 it, it's, you're not intending to preach. You could just be sharing a tidbit that you felt like sharing because it was, important, it was useful, and they go, oh, here's the sheikh or a sheikh, right? They're, they're going to give us a halakha now. Everybody sit, and they, they, they go further with it. You know, you got to keep your cool for those few seconds or else it all goes, it goes to waste. So he's saying, I don't want to be that. I know, I know what that's like. I know I myself need the advice, and I know that, you know, I'm not doing everything that I preach, so I, I, I refuse to do it. But then he said, And then it occurred to me, you know, I had an idea, you know what, let me, let me just answer this request. Why? First of all, I'm fulfilling the need of a fellow Muslim. That itself is its own. There's a hadith about it. That whoever fulfills the need of their fellow Muslim, Allah fulfills their need. And that for me to fulfill a need of my fellow Muslim is more for me to walk with my Muslim brother in a need of his. This is the wording of the hadith. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for, for me to walk side by side with my Muslim brother or sister, fulfilling their need is more beloved to me than a month at the kaf in my masjid, meaning in Masjid Nabawi. So we have all these hadith that show us how important it is to fulfill the needs of our fellow Muslims. So he's saying number one is seeking that reward for fulfilling the need of a fellow Muslim and what dua ahili and him making dua for me. So that's a special thing that I will seek out his dua, that he'll make dua for me in return for this good deed. And this last part is what I want to focus on here. When you when you and that I'll have 
reward for him acting upon my advice. So this is the first stop that we'll take. And you're going to see that a lot, the book's actual material is quite simple. But these stops, these reflections that I want us all to make are the key that, that we'll take from here. A lot of times you hold back on giving advice. Right? You don't want to be looked at as, you're going to say this person's a sheikh, this person's religious. It comes with a lot of baggage. Or not just how people look at you, how they respond, just you yourself. You know that you have a lot of shortcomings, that you don't do everything that you know. You don't fully practice what you preach. You have a lot of sins that you do in private that no one else knows about. So that holds you back from advising people as well. A third thing is that you might think it might come back to haunt you. That if I give this person advice here, then tomorrow they see me doing something wrong or haram. Now I'm a hypocrite. So all these things, they, and they, they, they occur at once very often, and then they stop you from giving advice. Or stop you from doing something good publicly that others would have benefited from. And there, there's a real fight there, which is, is your intention sincere? Are you being a hypocrite? That's a real fight that we all should have inside of us. Right? That, that fight should never be abated. Where she say, no, I'm perfectly fine. I'm always sincere. I'm, that's just, you know, nonsense thoughts that I don't need. Or, um, you know, I'm in the clear in regards to my sin. I may, you know, I seek tawbah. It's between me and God, as Donald Trump says. No one else has any business between it. I don't need to do anything else. And, and I'm all set. Though that's a dangerous way of thinking. We should be worried about our sins. We should remember them constantly. We should, you know, constantly be teetering that line between despair and hopefulness and Allah's mercy. We'd never let it get to the point of despair, but we never let it get to the point of guarantee where I'm set, Allah will forgive me no matter what. But with that being said, we should never allow that to stop us from doing good. That's a, that is a goal of shaitan in and of itself. Where to use your sins, to use your past or your current state to prevent you from helping others. So that is a trick of shaitan that we have to be wary of. And... The, the, the result, the, the, the solution to it is to rectify your intention in one sitting, in one go, and then just do it. Right? Nike had it right about that one. Just do it. Just go for it. Don't second guess yourself. If it's in and of itself, it's good. Salah, dhikr, Quran, you already know that's good, right? You don't need anyone to tell you whether it's good or not. Then in, for your own intention, say, my intention is just like he's, Ibn Qudam is saying here. I want the reward, number one, of helping a Muslim brother in need. I want his du'a for me. And I want the reward of him perhaps acting upon some of what I'm about to teach him or, or tell him. And for me, I also would like to be of those who guide others to good, even if me, myself, do, I don't do all of it. So if I can't do all of it, at least I'm a guide to all of it, right? I may not do all the different categories of good, but I can guide to so, many, so much of it by just sharing this information. So this he's saying, then I said, let's I'll go for it. Bismillah. And then he wrote, writes this book. This book goes to these individuals, whoever they are, right? I don't even know who they are. They publish it or they share it with their friends. It gets copied. And then now, hundreds of years later, we're teaching in a masjid in New Jersey, right? Far beyond anywhere that he imagined it would reach. But inshallah, he's getting all these rewards. So that's the first stop, which is just do it. Don't let shaitan have you second guess any good. If it is good, just go for it. Rectify your intention. That's a battle that will always be recurring inside of you. That will never end until you die. So my intention is for the sake of Allah, for the reward, everything that he mentioned here and more, and then you just go forward. You don't second guess yourself. You don't let these uh, misgivings and shortcomings hold you back. Something also interesting about this is that there's many examples of this throughout Islamic history. So... The, mono, the most famous books after what is the most famous book in Islam after the Quran? Sahih Bukhari. We're generally it's the, the top hadith compilation. Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim are the top Sahih compilations, even though there's thousands of compilations of Sahih Hadith. They're not unique in their idea, they're not unique in their execution, but these books became the most famous. They were the most well put together, and uh, the, the authors were the forerunners in making Sahih compilations. In their time, there was no Sahih compilations. People had hadith compilations on their own and just thousands upon thousands of hadith. You'd have to sift through it and basically like an encyclopedia. So one of Bukhari's teachers during a lesson, his name was Ushaq ibn Hawiya. He just says, it would be a good idea if someone made a Sahih compilation. So Bukhari says, when I heard that, I said, that's me. That's my job. And now his book is the most famous Sahih compilation. You know, over a thousand... 200 years later. How many Sahih compilations have there been since then? 
thousands. Some very close to his level of fame, but why did his become number one? Some sincerity in his heart for sure, but also he was a forerunner. His teacher gave him the idea and he went with it. So similar to this book, it was an idea given by other people. He, one person capitalized on it and then we see the effect of it until today. They say even that is the case about Sheikh Minshawi, rahimahullah, that he, he died at a very young age in his early 40s, if I'm not mistaken. And someone suggested to him, why don't you record the Quran? And this is in a time where it was still brand new. The radio, uh, where they were doing live recordings of the Quran, that was a new thing in Egypt. So he agreed with the idea. He records the whole Quran, and a few short later, he, a few short years later, he dies. Right? But now his Quran recording, Sheikh Manshawi, is there anywhere in the country that or any any country that doesn't know it? It's ubiquitous across the Muslim Ummah. So that was also an idea that someone else had. So what's the point of all this? Similar to this book, is you don't know how far this good will go, just do it. Don't second guess yourself. Don't second guess your intention. Try your best to make it sincere. And that's just a split second inside of yourself, right? Don't let that battle extend more than that. And then you just do it and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for acceptance. So he says this was the idea for this book. And his first chapter, we'll probably go over the first, uh, what, what time does this end? When someone throws something? An hour, okay. Inshallah. Definitely don't plan to go on for that long. I can't imagine listening to me for an hour straight, but inshallah, if we could finish the first chapter or two, that'd be good. For people who are scared, that's 11 pages. It's okay. It's the first two chapters, so don't worry. Inshallah, I'm, I have ordered a couple of the books in English. I'm just, there's uh, two different versions. I'm going to see which translation that I personally like before I recommend it for you guys. And it's definitely a good book to have. It's good for reminders in case you ever have to give them in an MSA or a halaqa or a Khatir or anything of that nature, it's perfect for that. Um, just don't read the book, then watch any of my khutbas because you'll see <laughs> where I got everything from. You'll, you'll, you'll get my source material. But that's not a problem, inshallah. So the first chapter is called Dunya Fursa Faqtanimha. The dunya is an opportunity, so seize it. This is something, like I was saying earlier, a lot of the topics, and even as we go through the material that he writes, it's common sense. It's not like stuff that's super deep. But the real question is about the reflection. Do I do this? Do I live like this? That's why he put the book together. It wasn't to offer new academic information. It was to um, open our eyes to the realities that we all acknowledge but don't live by. And I kind of skipped over his introduction. We'll do that quickly. We'll do that later, inshallah. It's okay. Actually, for... for for me personally, his, his intro comes at the end of the book. Not exactly sure why. And for me, I, I like it that way. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll save it like that. Or we'll do that, inshallah, the first session next week. We'll begin with his introduction, Ibn Qudaymah, who he was. But with the first chapter, he says, No, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on you. That this dunya is the harvest of the hereafter. This is the plantation of the hereafter. Meaning you're going to harvest then what you're planting now. And it's the marketplace where you collect your profit. So you're investing here and you collect your profit there. And it is where you collect all of the investments. So he's telling you, if you want to know the reality of, of the hereafter and the reality of the dunya, you need to think of this dunya as a place of investment, a place of planting. That's all it is. And the hereafter is where you will collect. The hereafter is your payday. So you will only collect that which you have put forth. And through this plantation through this marketplace this dunya is talking about this is the same place where the righteous and the pious and the sabakun those who dusted everyone in terms of goodness and the truthful this is where they've gotten these titles so they've become the truthful they've become the righteous they've become a sabakun based on what they have done here and likewise the losers the criminals they earn those titles here so they, the, the, win, the wins and the losses, the W's and the L's that were all presented here. They were just collected in the hereafter. So he's saying, that's the first thing you need to realize. This is where everyone in the hereafter reaps what they sowed here. So this is what, the first thing he wants you to realize. And the next thing he wants you to realize, which is pretty much the next few pages of the chapter, he says that this dunya is the wish, the dream of the people of the hellfire and the people of Jannah. Their dream, they both wish for nothing more than this dunya. How? He goes into it. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, 
about the people of the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our families and all Muslims. Allahumma ameen. وهم يصطرخون فيها ربنا أخرجنا نعمل صالحا غير الذي كنا نعمل and another verse ولو ترى إذ وقفوا على النار فقالوا يا ليتنا نرد ولا نكذب بآيات ربنا ونكون من المؤمنين the two verses where Allah سبحانه وتعالى says and they call out they scream out in it oh our Lord free us from it from the hellfire and return us to the dunya so that we can do good unlike what we used to do let us go back so we can do it different and then another verse, if you could see them when they stand over the fire now, as they're about to enter it, when they're standing over it, they said, Woe to us, we wish we could return. And do not deny the, the verses of our Lord, and we'll be amongst the believers. So he's saying that the evil people here, these two verses and these others, show that they're both, that in both these scenarios, both these verses, they're wishing they can come back. And do the opposite of that which they used to do. And then now he says, for the righteous... We have the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud where he says, Inna arwah, it's a long hadith, Inna arwah al-shuhada ka tayrin khudrin tasrahu fil jannah haythu sha'at. That the souls of the martyrs, those who gave their lives for the sake of Islam, for protecting the innocent, for upholding justice, these are the ones who are given the title of shuhada in Islam. And we know from many hadith and ayat that they are the highest status. Like they gave it all. Right? They didn't just live for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they died for the sake of Allah. So not only was their life, you know, spent in a way that was obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the degree of their sacrifice was so high that they gave everything they could. Their physical being, they gave it. They put it on the line and sacrificed it when the time came. So they're the highest status. They are in the hearts. They are in the, the chests of green birds. So their souls are inside of green birds in Jannah, as the hadith says. Going wherever they will. They fly about Jannah as they please. And they land on lanterns that are hanging from the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the imagery the Prophet is giving us. Of course, it's far beyond what we can imagine. But this is the hadith, its text, what it's telling us. So they're in the hearts of green birds in Jannah, flying about as they please. And they land within these lanterns that are hanging from the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they come to him in this fashion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi saluni, O my servants, ask me whatever we'd like. What do you want? These are people who remember who gave it their all. They've sacrificed everything. Now they're in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's asking them, what do you want? What do you think they would say? They have it all. Right? They're in Jannah. This is before the Day of Judgment. This is before that they are, before everyone enters Jannah. This is in the Barzakh, the spiritual realm between these two stations, this world and then the hereafter. As many scholars have said. So they're in this preview of Jannah, they're enjoying it, they're in the presence of Allah, they're in this beautiful form where they're in green birds flying as they will. And they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them, what do you want? They said, they say, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask that you return us back to this world. Return us back to the dunya. So that we can die for you one more time. These are people who gave it their all, they're saying, send us back to give her our all one more time. So this is their biggest dream, to come back here. That's the point of what he's trying to say. Of course, they are enjoying Jannah. They're being rewarded. They're in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They've gotten this approval that our whole life is about. But when they get there, they wish they can come back and do what they did one more time, which was give it their all. Put their lives on the line again. A lot of times we see these people who go through these things and say, that really, that really sucks. Right? I wish I wasn't in that situation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from ever being in, in such a situation. But then when they die and they see the reward, they wish to come back and do it all over again. So this is showing us the reality of the dunya, which is a big theme of, of the entire book. But the whole point of what he's saying is that they wish to come back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them that he decreed that those who exit this dunya never return. It's a one-way street until the day of judgment. And then when he sees that this is all they will ask for, they are left to be. To enjoy the, this preview of Jannah until the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us and our families of its inhabitants, Allahumma ameen. So he's saying the righteous want to go back to do more, and the evil want to go back to do less or do something different. So it shows you that this, their wish for both the righteous and the wicked is to return to the dunya. Then he says now, a quote by Ibrahim al taymi Who is Ibrahim al taymi He says here in the footnote, he is Ibrahim ibn Yazid al taymi He was a righteous scholar, and he was an imam and a leader, and a faqih, a scholar of fiqh, and he was known as Abid al-Kufa, the worshipper of al-Kufa, city in Iraq. 
So the monk of Kufa, basically. That's, you know, he was known for his worship that they gave him that title. And his father, Yazid, was of the scholars of Kufa, who was fundamental in his teaching and his upbringing. Imam al Dhahabi, in his collection of biographies of the righteous people, he says about him, He was a righteous youth. He was a young man who was very righteous, who would go around advising others, teaching others about Islam. And he was devout in his worship. He'd be worshiping all the time. He was publicly known for that. And he was a scholar of fiqh and he, had, he was very magnanimous. He had a, a, lo, a lofty status, right? He carried himself in a very high way. And Al-Amash, another scholar of hadith from the earliest generation, says about him that if he made sujood, you would think he's a piece of a wall. He wouldn't move until the birds would land on him. So birds would land on this guy and when he's in public making sujood. Back then the masajid were very open air style. Um, birds would land on him from how still he would be and they wouldn't move as he's in sujood. And it was said about him that he was killed by Al-Hajjaj in his bloody reign of terror. Or others say no, he, was, he died in Hajjaj's prison in the year 92 Hijri. So it's very early. This is one of the earliest generations who met the companions. He's from the Tabi'een, Ibrahim ibn Yazid al-Taymi. And it says here he died and he was not yet 40 years old. So subhanAllah, these people have this legacy and they, a lot of them didn't live too long. But they started early and that is one of the things that earns Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favor. Right, that's something that we all seek here, being uh, relatively young, most of us or all of us, right? Seeking that special status of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when supposedly you have better things to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates that. He sees that. He knows that there's other options. And he appreciates that so much so that he gives you an elite status on the Day of Judgment. One out of the seven categories of people who are shaded, right? On the Day of Judgment, the day when there is no shade except the shade which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides. One of these seven, the Prophet said, is a young man or woman who spent their youth in the servitude and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you have a lot, of, a lot of other options. He knows how enticing they are and he appreciates that you choose to be here in, instead. So that's something that's commendable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from all of us. Allahumma ameen. How did we get here? How did we get here? What were we talking about? It's 8.30 on a weekday, we got to do this. A couple guys thinking, how did I get here? Car, no. We're talking about Ibrahim at right? That was the, the tangent. Ibrahim at said this quote. He says, I consider myself in Jannah. Thought about it, imagined. And I have the woman on my arms. I have the you know all the food and drink I want. He's imagining as the descriptions that we have of Jannah and as being a young man, what a young man would imagine. So he says, I said to myself, I imagine saying to myself as I'm in, I'm in Jannah, you know, he's thinking of this grand entrance that we see celebrities have here in their parties and whatnot. Except it's halal, right? He's thinking of it in, 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 in the situation where it would be halal. So he says, I'm eating from a true. I have the woman on my arms. I'm enjoying. In that situation, I thought to myself, what would I ask myself? What would I want? What would I ask myself, what do you want in that situation? And I would imagine that I would say to myself, I wish to do more so I can have more. All this is really nice. I wish I had more of it. So I wish I could go back to the dunya and do more. And then I thought of myself in the hellfire. Going through its punishments, its negative environment, all the descriptions that we have of its heat, of its wind, of its flame. And I said to myself, and I imagined saying to myself, what would you want in this situation? Asking myself, what do you want now? And it would answer saying, I wish I could go back to the dunya and not be in this situation. Since I know that what I did in the situation in the dunya is what made this situation. So then he said, now that I snapped out of this daydream, out of these two scenarios that I proposed to myself, I told myself, Ya nafs, fa'anti fil umni ya fa'amali. Right now you are in the dream. You're in the dream in either situation. If you were in Jannah or you're in Nar, you're where you would want to be in both situations. So get to work, get busy. And it was also, he says here, narrated by, about some of the Salaf, what they would do, the righteous generations of the past, scholarly generations, those who were closer to the source, who had more knowledge, who were more in tune with the revelation. He says, well, narrated by a lot of them that they would dig a grave. And this is something that you could try if, if, if you're up to, at least visiting the graveyard, it does have a profound effect. And if you can stomach this, or if it's something that you, you'd be willing to try, it also helps. They physically dig a grave and then sit in it. And consider the fact that one day, much sooner than we'd all like, and for much longer than we'd like, that this is where we'll be. How long will you live in this dunya? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you to be of those who, you know, who have a long life, a hundred years, how much will you spend in your grave? Most likely more than a hundred. So the, the, the default for the majority of mankind, if not almost all of them, is that you spend more time in your grave than ever outside of it. So some of them would put themselves physically in that situation. I'm not saying, you know, for you to do it. Maybe it's not for you. That's fine. But definitely visiting the graveyard is a good eye-opening experience. Because when you go there and you look around, where are the sick people? Where are the, who, who are the ones who drop dead with a clean bill of, bill of health? Where, is the, where, you know, who, where are the geezers? And where are the infants? Where are the prince, where's the prince and the pauper? Right? You can't tell. Who was a dignitary? Who drove a Mercedes? And who drove a, a Civic? None of that is apparent when you go there. And it's very humbling. Right? It's something that we should do every once in a while to snap back into it. So he's saying, well, it's narrated about some of the righteous. They dig a grave and they'd sit inside of it and consider this predicament. Consider everything that we just said. And they would say, you know, consider the fact that you will be spending time in a similar environment, tiny dirt hole, and your only wish will be to return and do good deeds. Right, there's many, and all these, by the way, all these, sometimes we will go back to the source hadith or ayat and explore them, look at tafsir for extra insight, and sometimes we'll just go through it like we are today, but all this goes back to hadith. So a lot, a lot of these narrations of the righteous and what Ibrahim al taymi said and all these different quotes, they'll, you'll find a hadith that you can go back to and you'll see similar statements by the Prophet Sallallahu We'll try to mention at least one or two every night so we can connect with the source material that they themselves use to connect in this fashion. So basically they would tell themselves, you are in a situation that you will be in soon. And in this situation, people only think of doing more good deeds. So here you are. You're not really in this situation, right? You're, you're, you're going to get up out of this grave and go back home. So do the good deeds is what they were reminding themselves. So he's saying consider their dream to say just tasbih one more time, subhanallah. Or to do a single hasana. Or to make tawbah for one more action. One more curse word, right? One more. That's really... When it comes down to it, what do you think they're thinking day in and day out? In that time that they're spending in their graves, they're probably going over this rap sheet, going over these possibilities of what they could have done. One more tasbih, one more subhanAllah, what would it do to my situation? That's what they're thinking, he's saying. One more tawbah for this sin, what would have, how my situation could have changed right now? Because that situation, that's it, it's permanent. It no longer changes at that point. Your dunya, your rap sheet of the dunya is full. And it was also, he mentions here another story of one of the righteous who visited a grave and he prayed two rakahs nearby. And then he relaxes before heading out and then he falls asleep. And he sees in his dream the person who's in this grave that's nearby. And he says, he tells him, you have caused me great harm. The person in the grave who is seeing in his dream is telling him, you've caused me great harm by praying here. Because these two rakahs that you prayed by me witnessing them or knowing that you prayed them, I realize that they're more beloved to me than the dunya and everything in it. Because you guys do without knowing the reality. Well, we know the reality, but we cannot do. So he's saying, You guys don't know the reality. You don't know how bad someone wishes to add to their good deeds. You don't know how bad someone regrets the, the evil that they've done until that veil is lifted, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. But this is the reality. That until, when that veil is lifted of this dunya to the hereafter, which happens at the moment of death, the person realizes these realities, right? They, 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 they become ultimate realities. That's the meaning of some scholars have said, Basaruka al-Yawma Hadid. Your vision today is like iron. It's in, unmistakable. There's no doubt. You're 100% sure now. When this veil is lifted, you're like, oh, okay. This is what was important. This is what life was all about. But that realization is useless at that point. So this is what, of course, this is just a dream. It's not hadith or anything, but the meaning is 100% true. Which is, this person is saying, we know this reality now, but we can't do any different. While you guys have the opportunity to act, but this reality is foreign to you or you know, purposely forgotten. So he's saying, take advantage. He comes down and says, So he's saying, take advantage now, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy of your valuable life. Your life is very, very valuable. 
It is something that you cannot put a price on and your, your times are precious. They're very rare and they're very precious. They should not be taken for granted. So he's saying now if you compare this life, if you just think of another aspect, so now at first he's talking about the regret of the people of the graves, right? How badly they wish to come back and that this dunya is the dream of the righteous and the wicked alike. The righteous to increase in their good and the wicked to make amends. Now he's, he says that if you compare this life to eternity, what does it mean? All right, what, what, where's the math majors? When, you, when a number's limit is approaching infinity, you treat it as... Calculus, no one, calculus, pre-cal. People are smiling knowing that they should remember this, but they definitely don't. When a number is approaching zero, uh, bro, uh, I just said it. When you're approaching infinity, you treat it as zero because infinity is so large that any number you put on top of it becomes zero, right? I had to take this three times, so of course I remember it. There's an explanation for each time, though, I swear. So he's saying if you compare this life with a thousand thousand years, which is a million, 65, 100 years out of a million. What is the percentage? It's like 0.001%, right? It's absolutely almost insignificant. What, well, that's just a million. 100 out of a million. What if you made 100 out of 500 million or a billion? The number gets increasingly, increasingly insignificant. So he's saying if, if, if you recognize that the hereafter is forever and this life is so limited, why would you make that trade-off, right? Why would you make dunya decisions consistently? Why would you prefer the dunya in your decisions all the time when you fully recognize, just math, mathematically speaking, that this world will be insignificant in terms of time? So if someone tells you to sacrifice this time or be patient for its duration, that should be a no-brainer. right? So he's saying, again, these are realizations that we know, the comp comparisons that we can easily make, but do we do anything different? So the next portion now, the next part of this chapter, he's speaking about, he gives a metaphor about the dunya. And that's the end of the chapter. Um, it's 8.40 now. Probably take us like 20 minutes or so, or 10, 10 to 20 minutes to do the metaphor. Should we save it till next week? Okay, so I think we, we've pretty much hit about an hour, a little bit, probably around 50 minutes. So we'll, we'll pass an hour if we start the story. I'd rather do, inshallah, one shot. So we'll, we'll save that till next week. We'll do the story of, he gives a metaphor regarding this dunya and uh, that's the end of that chapter then maybe we'll start next the chapter next week or the example of the dunya to close out the first chapter plus the biography of Ibn Qudamah since we skipped over it this week inshallah that's what we'll do next week um, I'll also like I said I'll have a couple of the um, I'm going to be checking out the English books so I can recommend one for you guys that way if, uh, if, if either translation is feasible or possible to me I'll let you guys know and you can buy it just to close out, inshallah, something that I want to do for each section that we cover. He mentions ayat and hadith on his own, but just so that we can, like I said, connect to the source material. A lot of times when we look at these hadith, we'll see where everything from the chapter is coming from. So one hadith he, he, that, is, that came to mind when I was looking at this chapter, the Prophet said, Mali walid dunya, dunya tahta shajaratin thumma raha wa tarakaha. He says, what, what, what do I need or what do I have to do with the dunya? What is my business with the dunya? And this is a statement that he made several times, sallallahu alayhi wa A lot of times when luxuries were being presented to him, and luxuries, you have to put them in quotations because if you see the certain luxuries that he reacted to, they're not even luxuries, right? They're things that are quite simple, but that's how far he was from the luxuries of the dunya, how disinterested he was, sallallahu alayhi wa So he's saying, what do I need to do with the dunya? What do I have to do with the dunya? The example of me in the dunya, the parable, comparison of me in the dunya is like a rider on a journey who stopped to rest under the shade of a tree and then after his rest he got up and he left so he's saying that dunya the entirety of our existence is like that stop in the shade you're on a journey you're going towards a purpose and the dunya is simply a stop there to fulfill a purpose which is in terms of the rider gives him shade it gives him rest so that he can continue so he's saying this is us this is his example so I and he's our example that we are uh, look at, we must look at the dunya with a similar lens right? And this is exactly what Ibn Qudama Was talking about in these last few pages Inshallah will begin with the example That he draws of the dunya and all the people in it He gives them different categories And we'll see if that's accurate And more importantly where do we fit In all of this So Zakam al-Khairan guys for your patience and your attentiveness
I hope it was of benefit. Inshallah, looking forward to continuing the journey through this book um, in the next couple of weeks. Any questions, comments, feedback? All right. Zakumullah khairan for your attentiveness again. And I look forward to seeing you inshallah next week. Subhanahu wa barah muhamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha la anti istaghfiru wa tubu alayk. Sallallahu wa barakatuh. Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi sahbihi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.